So welcome everyone to this webinar. This is about Airbnb and beyond the emerging trends and the risks in the STR or the short-term rental industry. My name is Neil Bao. I'm your host. And with me, I have Anna Myers, who's my partner and an Airbnb super host herself. Now, hello. Hello, hello. And most of you, by the way, know us. And you might be thinking, why is Neil Bauer talking about a webinar on short-term rentals or Airbnb when clearly he's not a short-term rental guy himself, professionally? Well, I have said that to lots and lots of investors, but they keep asking, keep demanding a webinar on short-term rentals. So this is basically a demand-based webinar. It's a request-based webinar. Now, as it happens, both Anna and I do have experience with Airbnb. She's super host. I've had two properties with Airbnb rentals, neither with Grow Capitus. They were with the company I was with before Grow Capitus. So um, interesting experience with short-term rentals. Now, more importantly, though, I was just very curious about short-term rentals. So I really enjoy doing the research that I'm going to present for the webinar. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and But please understand, we are not short-term rental experts. Well, I should say I am not. Anna is. Uh, and you should take our research and then dig, dig into the trends some more. So over 1,400 of you signed up for this webinar. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of you out there that want to dig deeper into the short-term rentals. But it is important that we also address those people that are fairly new to the short-term rental phenomenon. So it's good to start with a short introduction to the SDR revolution for those of you that don't have direct experience. So let's spend a few minutes really defining the short-term rental industry and its business model. All right, let's kick things off by uh, breaking down what short-term rentals or SDRs really are. So we're talking about, you know, mix of vacation homes and condos and apartments and even rooms in someone's house. So whether it's a weekend getaway or a quick business trip uh, or a temporary stay while you're remodeling your kitchen, SDRs, they have you covered. You know, these properties are rented for less than 30 days. And honestly, they cover a pretty broad range. So the magic here is the flexibility. You can stay anywhere, mountain cabin, city loft. I mean, they give you that home away from home feeling, except you're paying by the night instead of by the month. Now let's dive into why people love SDR so much. So firstly, for hosts, you know, it's all about making that extra cash, you know, whether they're renting out a room or an entire property, great way to bring in money. Uh, guests, they like love the variety. Um, you know, these are a personal, unique experience compared to a typical hotel. So you can stay in a charming local neighborhood like the one that Anna just showed us, not some generic hotel chain off the highway. Plus, there's a pretty good chance you'll meet some interesting people along the way, including your host. <laughs> and don't forget the community benefits. So these SDRs bring huge numbers of tourists, huge numbers of dollars into areas that typically might not see a lot of hotel traffic. So it's a win-win-win situation for everyone. Neil, you have a, a little Microsoft PowerPoint pop-up there. You might want to oh, okay. answer. Right. It's right in the middle of your screen. You Perfect. Go. All right. So obviously, no discussion of short-term rentals is complete without an introduction to Airbnb, which started as a way for two guys to rent out air mattresses in their apartments to make some extra money during a conference in 2008. Uh, by the way, that mattress is where the word air, Airbnb comes from. So now it's a global platform where, where you can book everything from apartments to entire islands. The short-term rental industry I'm is gonna, taking- I'm going to skip past that particular video. Now, these guys are the biggest company in the short-term rental space. They're, you know, the 800-pound gorilla. So how do they make their money? Well, it's actually pretty brilliant. They connect people who need a place to stay with people who have extra space to rent. Hosts make money by renting out their homes and apartments or a spare room. Guests get affordable and often very unique places to stay. Now, Airbnb, of course, takes a cut from both sides. So they take about 3% from hosts, 5 to 15% from guests. They're basically a middleman, but one that's really good at turning a profit. So they provide the platform, they facilitate the payments, and in return, they've built a pretty huge business billions of dollars. Now, I'm a huge fan of Airbnb myself, and I've traveled the entire world living in lots and lots of different Airbnbs. This is a screenshot from my personal Airbnb account for the last wow. five years. I, I, I skipped the COVID year, by the way. So I am going here uh, on a cruise um, on Royal Caribbean's new, newest mega ship. So I'm living here in Davenport in the Orlando Metro with my family. And I've lived in Airbnbs in many of the great cities of the world. So if you look at these little icons, you'll see everything from London, Paris, Dubai, Rome, Miami, 
multiple destinations in the Caribbean, Thailand, Bali, Marrakesh, Turkey, and obviously lots and lots of lovely places in the US. And the joy that I feel when I go to a high quality Airbnb, bar none. So for my 25th anniversary, I took the family to Bali and also to the island of Phuket in, in Thailand. And there we lived in an Airbnb that I think can only be described as ultra luxury. So you can see the p uh, pictures from the property. On the right, you can see us at the property. This property was only about $700 a day for five people to live there with an included chef and airport pickups. And that is Airbnb's true gift to the world. To be able to live in astonishing locations, exquisite places, and have your dollar go so much further than it does here in the US. And yes, maybe you're thinking, Neil, but I can't afford $700 a day. Well, I encourage you to look at Airbnb in your price range on the island of Phuket. And I can tell you that $100 a night still buys you some pretty amazing stays far beyond anything that you could get in the US. So in that way, Airbnb created a completely new way to experience the world for tens of millions of travelers. All right, so now let's do a quick industry overview. Remember, industry is brand new, didn't exist before 2008. So we're talking about an industry that's only 16 years old. So it's important to look at the milestones for such a disruptive industry that's really still a baby. So let's take a trip down Airbnb's memory lane first. So started in 2008 with a loft in San Francisco. Fast forward to today, Airbnb is a global giant. By 2011, they had expanded internationally. They had opened offices in Europe. By 2019, they had hosted 500 million guests, half a billion people, right? Even, you know, what in, in basically the first decade. In 2020, they went public. Um, they were valued at 47 billion at the time of going public. And that is the kind of crazy growth that startups dream about. And let's not forget all the cool things they've added along the way. Uh, you know, they've added Airbnb experiences. They've added Airbnb Plus. It's, it's like watching your kid grow up, you know, get an MBA. Now let's talk about the competition. When it comes to booking accommodations, they're clearly not the only player in, in the game. On this slide, you can see the top players in booking accommodation. And yes, it's not fair to compare Airbnb with you know, booking.com because Airbnb, they're just a search engine for hotels, whereas companies like uh, in Airbnb, um, you know, uh, disrupting the global hotel giants like you know, Marriott or Hilton. So what you should take away from the, this is that SDR platforms are growing much faster than traditional hotels, and which is why they're getting a lot of attention and why the market's really heating up. As of July 2024, July this year, Mar Airbnb's market cap has surged all the way to $94 billion, far outpacing traditional hotel giants. So as a comparison, Marriott, you see on this slide, they're the industry leader. They sit at $69 billion and Hilton's at $54 billion. And this massive difference in market capitalization, it reflects Airbnb's dominance in this accommodation space. Unlike traditional hotels, Airbnb benefits from a very scalable, very asset-like model. They don't own properties, so lower overhead, easier you know, expansion. In contrast, hotel chains require massive amounts of capital to first build and then maintain their properties. And that limits their ability to scale as quickly. So, Interestingly, interestingly, Airbnb's rise also highlights this interesting shift in consumer behavior because travelers are increasingly seeking very unique, very local experiences over the standardized hotel stays. So you saw the pictures from my vacations. I mean, what hotel looks like that, even in the same price range in Thailand, right? This change in consumer taste is what has allowed Airbnb to capture a very large share of the market, including long-term stays, which, you know, as you can imagine, have been boosted by this COVID work from anywhere trend. All right, so this is where things get very exciting. Let's look at the future. The short-term rental industry is actually booming. In 2023, last year, the market was valued at 29 billion worldwide. By 2033, 10 years from then, it's projected to nearly triple, triple from 29 billion to 81 billion. Now that's a huge leap in just 10 years, right? Who's driving this growth? It's millennials, it's Gen Z there that are leading the way, you know, for work, travel. It's not just about weekend trips anymore. We're seeing longer stays, more family vacations, and there's a shift towards non-urban destinations. 
you know, post COVID people gravitate towards, you know, the quieter and less crowded spots. And it's now very clear that SDRs are not just a passing trend. They're actually the future of travel, right? I just want to emphasize this. The industry is expected to have double digit growth on average in the next 10 years. Any industry that grows more than two or 3% a year is growing much faster than the norm. So it's fair to say that the short-term rental industry is going to grow much, much, much faster than the typical industry. That's the bottom line. That's the good news. So you want, might want to think about buying Airbnb stock during the next dip or the next recession. Now with all of this growth comes a bit of a backlash. So cities across the US are starting to crack down on SDRs, stricter regulations, especially in big cities like New York, San Francisco. Why? Because there's true concerns, uh, reasonable concerns about housing affordability. You've got neighborhood disruption, you've got you know, tax revenue issues. Basically, SDRs are making it harder for locals to find affordable long-term houses, uh, housing, and, and cities are not getting their share uh, of the pie in terms of the hotel taxes. So these cities are trying to find that balance between letting SDRs operate and then keeping their communities intact. So, you know, they're refereeing a game that's constantly changing. No one ever agrees on the rules. Some cities have had enough. They've either banned or heavily restricted SDRs. So look at places like, you know, New York City, San Francisco, Santa Monica. These cities are drawing hard lines. So in New York, you can't rent out an entire home for less than 30 days unless the host is present. That's weird. In San Francisco, you're limited to 90 days a year if you're renting out the whole place. Santa Monica, they've outright banned entire unit rentals. You can only do home sharing. So violating these rules can get you hit with major fines up to $7,500 in certain cities. So very clear that the regulations are getting tighter. And we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Okay, so we did the introduction to Airbnb. It brings you up to speed on where we are in 2024. Now, for those of you that are curious about short-term rentals as a business, right? But you're not sure, is this a good time to buy? Is this a bad time to jump in? Well, this whole section is for you. So we put together a lot of research to try and answer questions like, is this a good investment over the next five years? The answers, they depend on your beliefs, but we think that the trends, the outlook that we put together, they're gonna help you to make up your mind. Now, keep in mind, we're not pitching a short-term rental opportunity ourselves. We're also unlikely to pitch one in the future. You know, never say never. But this webinar is really based on a on repeated requests from you. We don't really have any agenda here. All right, so let's start with 2023, last year. So 2023 was actually of a mixed year for the SDR industry. We saw a 4.9% drop in RevPAR. I'm going to point this out right here. See that? You know, this RevPAR has a, you know, it, it basically means revenue per available rental. And it was the first full year decline since 2014. So you can see that RevPAR has been growing over the last five years, right? You see 29 2020, 2021 growth. You can see that revenue per property actually flatlined in 2022, and we saw a 5% decrease in 2023. So let's talk about why that happened. So clearly, there was a good trend of growth, including a shockingly high number of 18.6%. And this is, you know, 2021, this is after COVID. So why did we see a reduction by 5% in 2023? Well, it's partly because supply surged massively to over 1.5 million listings. Let's take a look at the table again. And you can see that between this year, 2021 and 2023, we saw almost half a million listings, new listings come online. That's massive. In the hotel industry, you typically see 2% or 3% growth in hotel rooms in a year. So over these two years, you might've seen 6% or 7%. This is almost a 50% increase in inventory in just two years. I can tell you, if this happened in my industry, the apartment industry, our rents wouldn't fall by 5%. They'd fall by 30 or 40%, maybe even more. So keep things in perspective. So this shocking spike in supply, it meant that occupancy rates, they also took a dive. And you can see them in this line here, right? So you can see them right here. So this forced hosts to lower their prices. But on the flip side, even in 2020, uh, 2023, we saw a record demand for nights booked. So the economy was stable, low unemployment, easing inflation. So the, yes, this was a challenging year for revenues, 
but there were definitely some bright spots right here in demand. What about this year, 2024? Well, this is actually shaping up to be a pretty decent, not strong year, but pretty decent year for short-term rentals. First, what you should know is we're looking at another massing avalanche of new listings, almost 11% higher room nights than last year, right? You can see this in the nights listed column. But with double digit increase in demand, right? Even this massive avalanche is likely to be absorbed. So the occupancy at 54.7 is almost exactly the same as last year. But the average daily rate, we call this ADR in the industry, it should go up by 2%. And the rev par, which is revenue per property, is also expected to go up by 2%. So the market is more or less keeping track with inflation, you know, but it's not outpacing inflation in 2024. Why? Massive, massive increase in new listings. 210,000 new properties came into the market just in one year. So bottom line, it's not all smooth sailing, but the outlook for 2024 is definitely promising, right? Positive rent growth. So if you're in the SDR game, you really have to keep your eyes open, be very tuned to new listings in, in your market, whatever your market is, because they're the ones that are really driving occupancy and ADR more than anything else. More about that growth in listing, right? So this has been nothing short of a roller coaster, right? So you'd see during the pandemics, we see a significant dip in, in available short-term rentals, all travel comes to a halt. But then once things start going up, you know, in 2021, 2022, we saw a hard rebound and very easily the industry surpassed the COVID levels very quickly, right? In 2023 alone, an additional 340,000 listings came online just between Feb and July with another 300,000 by October, right? So that's great for travelers, more options, but it also means a lot more competition for hosts. While revenues are 17% higher than pre-COVID levels, costs like mortgage and insurance have shot up, increasing over 30, 130% since COVID. No, that's not a typo. Combined insurance and mortgage costs are up over 130% since 2020, so while the market's expanding, profitability is much tighter and a lot of smart you know, pricing strategies are needed to make money. So let's dig into that, right? So a lot of you are like, okay, Neil, sum it up. Tell me what the investment yield is. A lot of you know what that is. Well, you're gonna be pretty disappointed by this slide, but I'm gonna just tell you the truth, right? So not so glamorous slide. Investment deals are down, costs are up. Now, let me show you how to read this graph, right? So this, these orange bars, these at the bottom, they are the investment yield, right? Obviously, the higher, the better. In general, investors want to be as close to double-digit uh, yields as possible. Now, there are individual Airbnb owners that have double digits, but the industry is nowhere near that level. If you look closely at the bars and you look at the y-axis on the right, you'll see that before COVID here, you know, 2018, 2019, the yield was about 6%. See, this is 5%, so it was about 6%, right? And since then, right? So once once the you know industry reopened after COVID, that you know yield went up, right, to nine or maybe even almost 10%. These are considered pretty darn good, by the way. Since then, they've been falling. You look at the numbers here on the right, the average investment yield in Airbnb is about three and a half percent. Right? And as you can see, looking at this slope, it might fall further because the trend is still declining. It hasn't flattened out. And the biggest reason for why there is such a shocking decline in yield, almost from you know over 9% to 3.5%, it's this line, this green line. So the green line shows mortgage payment increases. And as you think about it, as the green line goes up, the orange line goes down, same rate. It's as simple as mortgage payments and interest, right? Um, you know, uh, if, if it goes down in the future, we might see some improvement in the yield, but right now we're not seeing a flattening trend in the, in the yield. The other challenge is the revenue, right? You see this in the blue line. Revenue is down 11% from peak in early 2021 when prices were crazy high, right? Real problem given how much inflation we've had in the last three years. And I know these numbers are not sexy, but they're truthful, right? As investors, you really want the reality. You don't want the fluff, fluff, fluff. So these STRs, they used to be seen as cash cows, but now there's no doubt the margins are shrinking. It's still a profitable business, but you know the days of early money 
definitely behind us. So how should we make money in this environment? Well, the answer is to pick your location carefully. So let's slice and dice the occupancy trends uh, by location. Let's take a closer look at occupancy trends. You know, a bit of a mid mixed bag depending on the location. Coastal uh, resorts and mid-sized cities are seeing stable or even growing occupancy rates. So people are still chasing those Instagrammable destinations. Uh, mountain and lake resorts are also holding uh, strong. There's definitely the shift towards you know scenic and nature-based vacations. But take a look at urban cities, right? They're struggling a bit with occupancy rates dropping. Suburban and rural areas are still performing well. You know, people don't want to, they want to stay away from crowded cities. So it's clear that there's a desire for space and fresh air that's still driving the demand today in 2024. Now, uh, the crystal ball is out. But, you know, for 2024, we predict a slight bump in revenue, about 3% and for the whole industry, occupancy should hold stable around 54% occupancy. Um, so yeah, there was a correction in 2023, but 2024 is more a year of slow and steady improvement. Okay, next section. If you are serious about managing short-term rentals, you must have the right tools. Let's take a look at six of the most critical ones. First up, AirDNA. This platform, it's a game changer for market insights, for revenue for forecasting. They've got tools like uh, uh, Rentalizer and MarketMinder. They help you see what your property can earn based on all the local data. So Anna and I are huge fans of this company. They publish phenomenal data on the U.S. short-term rental market. A lot of the charts and the graphs that you're seeing are from the 24 SDR Outlook report. We condensed a lot of what they published. If you're going to be in this industry and you're not buying an AirDNA subscription, frankly, maybe you shouldn't be in the business. So great company. Check out their website. And then there's uh, Beyond Pricing. It uses um, real-time data to adjust your rates uh, automatically, uh, ensuring that you stay competitive. Uh, this one here, Price Labs, is uh, another um, option uh, for dynamic pricing. They also allow you to fine-tune your strategies based on marketing demand. market demand. Mashvisor is a tool that helps you analyze rental performance when you're buying the properties. And then you've got, you know, um, Hospitable. They're not, I think they're called Smart BNB now. Uh, they automate guest communication across multiple booking platforms. So, you know, BRBO, Booking.com, um, Airbnb, you can basically automate guest communication on all of them. Very useful. Um, all the rooms, by the way, is a, uh, it, it, it's a competitor to AirDNA. So it also brings it all together, offering, you know, market analysis, future trend insights, rents, things like that. So essentially these tools can basically streamline everything from pricing to guest communication. So basically you can focus on scaling your business. And before you ask, these people don't know us. They're not paying us. We're actually paying AirDNA for Anna's property. So, and to be honest, we think AirDNA is, is a bargain. Just one more slide on AirDNA. We really, really want you to understand that you cannot win without a tool like this. I mean, think of this as this all seeing eye into the SDR world. You know, you get real time insights on the property's performance, the market trends, competitor data. This is a personal assistant that tells you when to adjust your rates, right? And, and it's these, like the co star of short term It's like the co star of short term rentals. Right? I mean, analysis, which guests to target, which seasons to prepare for, how to maximize every square foot of your rental, right? It's like having a crystal ball, except this one actually works. Okay, well, no discussion of the STR space is uh, complete without discussing all the legal challenges. And we know that these challenges are getting worse, uh, but it's important to understand the scope and the likely nature of the legal uh, issues that you're going to face. So uh, regulations, I mean, oh boy, these are real, real challenges in the SDR world. Some cities have created what feels like an obstacle course for, for hosts. I mean, Boston's got some of the strictest codes. N New York has a rule, uh, rule where you can't even rent your entire place for under 30 days unless you're there. So it's like to play, you know, it's like playing Monopoly with a rule book that's a hundred pages long. Starting today, short-term rental hosts in New York, that's Airbnb or Booking.com, they're going to have to register with the city and they have to comply with a new law that states you cannot rent out your entire apartment for less than 30 days and hosts can only offer short-term rentals if they remain with their guests in the apartment. Hosts face fines of up to $5,000 per violation. 
There are about 40,000 Airbnbs in New York, but rampant abuse, that's where hosts rented dozens of units as kind of shadow hotel rooms. That led to a lot of neighbor and building complaints. City council members also say Airbnbs have raised rents in New York since they've taken all that inventory off the normal rental market. Airbnb calls the rules, quote, a blow to New York's tourism economy and the thousands of New Yorkers and small businesses in the outer boroughs who rely on home sharing and tourism do dollars to make ends meet in a very expensive city. Now, hosts say registration is almost impossible. Many have waited months for approval. Thousands of Airbnb listings have already started disappearing from the website. City councils in Dallas, Philadelphia, New Orleans have passed similar rules. So far, they haven't had much effect because they're so hard to enforce. This will be the test for New York starting today. Okay, now I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to talk about the issue of fairness. Landlords are not going to like this. So the truth is that the, these short-term rentals, they're not exactly playing on the same field as hotels. I mean, take New York City, for example, right? These STRs, they need to register with the Office of Special Informa Enforcement. You've got safety standards, occupancy limits, and then they're subject to hotel taxes plus other fees. Now, in Tampa, Florida, there are no restrictions, no need for host presence, no occupancy limit, no state-level advertising status. So this disparity creates an uneven fee, you know, playing field between SDRs in different regions. Um, and so, honestly, regulation consistency, it would be useful. It would be a game changer. It would level the field between, you know, SDR, uh, you know, hosts and traditional hotels. Until then, it's just the regulatory wild, wild west. Um, so some of the cities that have you know, tough rules I wanted to highlight. Uh, chapter 41A is a set of regulations that's designed. Oops, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause for just a second. I need to turn off my Roomba, which is trying to to eat my foot. Can I just pause for a second? Yeah. Where is my Roomba is trying to eat my foot? <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, muted, muted. I'm back, I'm back. Um, so, um, you know, we, we talked a lot of, a, a little bit about this, so I don't want to, to hammer it. Bottom line is these sorts of legislations are, you know, they, they started in Boston and now they're getting rolled out to other places. Hawaii is another example. Uh, you know, they essentially make short-term rentals illegal unless they're operating as a B B and b or a TVU, which stands for Transient Vacation Unit and get this, there are no new licenses being issued to BNBs or TVUs in residential areas. So if you don't already have one in Hawaii, you're out of luck unless your property is in a resort zones. Also, this bill requires hosts to have one million dollars in liability insurance. Now, at the state level, we're seeing even more moves towards regulating SDRs. New York, of course, passed that legislation in 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 2024. Uh, creating this statewide SDR registry, extending occupancy taxes to SDRs. Uh, Florida followed suit with a bill that allows local governments to charge registration fees and fine all these non-compliant SDR owners. Oregon's considering uh, bills to, in Texas. Proposals have been made, not yet passed, to limit uh, local control, to create local control over SDR reg regulations. All right, so I'm done with the, all the scary legislation, legal stuff. If this is still your cup of tea, let's move on to some best practices. We're going to give you some 10 effective strategies for your host playbook. First up, staying informed. Uh, of course, this landscape is changing, so you need to stay plugged into local regulations, all the market trends. What we highly recommend that you join SDR associations and follow all the newsletters in your area. Second, diversify, optimize your platforms. Yes, Airbnb is great, but why stop there? Some, some, some of the properties that uh, only use VRB, only use booking.com, and even promote direct listings through social media, through SEO, and you can increase your visibility and bookings. Um, if restrictions are very tough, uh, consider adapting your rental model, uh, offering longer stays, which can help bypass these uh, regulations, or, or maybe you can target corporate housing clients. Compliance is non-negotiable, so keep your permits up to date, ensure your tax filings are accurate, uh, and then next, engage with the community. You know, join local ad advocacy groups or attend city meetings, so you can actually play a role in shaping regulations in your area. Let's take it up a notch. 
enhance your property, um, you know, invest in amenities that guests crave, like, you know, ultra high speed internet or, you know, cozy outdoor sp uh, space, small touches like welcome notes or guidebooks make a big impact on satisfaction. And then of course there's dynamic pricing. So it constantly adjusts your rate based on market conditions. So beyond pricing, price labs, these tools can help you stay competitive. Also target marketing is, uh, is crucial. So know your audience, is it families? Is it digital nomads? Is it couples? And then tailor all of your marketing uh, accordingly. And finally, be very responsive, right? So quick response, you know, replies to inquiries. That's what's made Anna, you know, a, a superstar host with, you know, 700 plus five-star reviews. You know, keep your communication prompt, address your guest feedback, and that's going to give you those five-star reviews. Let's walk through a quick example. Actually, we're, we're out of time, so we're going to skip this example. All right. Well, it's not ever going to be uh, Neil Bawa or Grow Capitalist webinar without a discussion of the best markets. And that's what we're known for. So let's look at some interesting SDR markets. But before we look at the best markets for short-term rentals, let's spend 90 seconds on our mission, Neil, Anna's mission, my mission. Our mission is to build 10,000 mid-market rental townhomes in underserved, fast-growing secondary markets in low property tax states. That's a mouthful. We've been working on this for nearly two years. We're super excited to say it's almost ready for showtime. And we're doing this because the American dream of owning a home has been completely and utterly destroyed. Over the last 15 years, it's become practically impossible for a middle-class family that earns 60 to 85,000 a year to buy a starter home anywhere in the United States. And it already wasn't possible for them to buy a home in expensive cities, but over the last five years, the dream's been shattered even for the smaller cities. And that's devastating for hard -earned, uh, hard hardworking families throughout the country. They're left with two bad choices. Either they go to the boonies and rent a very old, very tiny single family home, or they completely abandon the American dream of living in a home and live in an apartment. And we know families don't want that. They want to live in a home, even if it's a rental home. And there's a huge shortage of 4.7 million homes. And our solution is Mission 10K. Rental townhomes are a replacement American dream. Every family can experience the joy, the comfort of having this place called home, a garage, a small backyard, no one running up and down the hallways, no marijuana smells or gunshots or Rottweil neighbors, Rottweilers to deal with. You know, and we love building these. Here's an example of a completed Mission 10K rental townhome community. This one's in Idaho Falls. It was a template for Mission 10K. It started in 2022, uh, 2020. This uh, townhome community is fully leased and its leasing velocity was excellent. It was built to be profitable at only $1,546 a month in rents. Um, tenant families have been delighted with the product. It was uh, built at an astonishingly low cost of $115 a square foot for vertical construction. It was built in phases, so it's completed almost two years with tenants now. We're seeing very low turnover from our tenants, boosting profits. Uh, it's got a small park, a playground. It's got a barbecue, seating area, dog park, as inexpensive amenities. Uh, townhomes are three bed, two and a half bath, 1,300 square feet. They've got nine foot ceilings on the lower level, and they've got um, a single car garage and private backyards. We sold this as a fourplex buyer project, but it's actually simple to recalculate the project's profits. And when calculated as a syndication with the regular splits and pref, it would have made its investors a strong 1.9x multiple with 22% average annualized returns. So we took that pilot properties ideas and concepts, we expanded to create Mission 10K, and it's this focused, very specific mission to build 10,000 townhomes in secondary cities throughout middle America. These townhomes, they're not over amenitized, so many of them don't have pools or gyms or clubhouses, but they're designed for families with income between 60,000 and 85,000, rents between 1,500 and 2,100 a month, right? So we only build in uh, cities or suburbs of secondary metros um, with, with metros that have you know, vertical construction costs between 120 and $145 a square foot. And that allows us to build townhomes with extremely reasonable rents. And I'm very, very pleased to announce that after almost two years of baking, we will be launching six, six Mission 10K projects in the coming year. You'll see amazing projects in Northwest Arkansas. So that's uh, Benton Mill, Rogers, uh, Kansas City, 
Reno, Nevada, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And these projects, some of them will be as short as three years in duration, and we expect them to be extremely profitable. So if you're interested, hopefully you are interested in learning more about this set of six projects, please, please, please make sure you answer the poll that we're going to throw up at the end of this webinar. Okay, done with my ad. Pay a time for the best SDR markets in the US. Now, where should you be looking? Well, let's start with Columbus, Georgia. This boasts a 9% effective cap rate and a very reasonable home value of around 161,000. The occupancy rate though here is high, it's 60%. That's a high rate for SDRs. And the average daily rate, the ADR, it's pretty awesome, right? $161,000 home, $178 a day. Well, that's about $29,000 a year in annual revenue. That's awesome. Logan, Ohio, Ohio. This is not Logan, Utah, Ohio. Another hot spot, right? Uh, whopping 12.2% cap rate. That's great. So, you know, home values here are higher, but the ADR is $343 a day. So that's a very profitable area. Right, especially, and if you're willing to invest a little bit more, you can try Sneeds Ferry in in North Carolina. You can try Port Angeles uh, in Washington. These are very strong ADRs, very solid returns. And the key here is you've got fairly low home values combined with high occupancy rates, and that's what makes these markets very attractive for SDR investors. Um, some more markets that are not just about high occupancy rates, but also about strong ADRs, strong revenue growth. And and I don't even know how to pronounce this city. A big quick we, a big we. New Mexico. This is uh, the ADR is pretty high, 100, 207 with a 63% occupancy rate. When you've got a $200 ADR with a 63% occupancy rate, that's pretty awesome, right? Smaller, less crowded markets. These are becoming popular post COVID. Uh, Cook City, Montana. That's another standout ADR of 318 and a 67% occupancy rate, right? Though I have to point out this city has very strict zoning and safety regulations, so you have to deal with that. Moving to the mountains, uh, you got Rico, Colorado, 63% occupancy, $244 ADR. And these, these areas, they may not have huge volume of big city markets, so you might not be able, able to buy five or 10 properties, but they're increasingly attractive because some of them have very good regulations, less competition, right? Some of them are into what is known as screen tourism. We'll mention that in a moment. So I, I wanna emphasize this list changes, which is why it's so important to get an AIR DNA license. If you're looking for cities where SDRs can thrive without being buried in red tape, if you're just focused on, okay, I want low legislation, well, here's the top list. Tampa, Florida, Orlando, Florida, they lead the charge with very SDR-friendly policies. So fewer regulations, higher profitability. Miami, Florida is another hotspot, strong demand for SDRs, fewer barriers to entry compared to you know New York, San Francisco. You've got Jacksonville, Florida, Chicago, Illinois. That last one's a surprise. Um, so these are cities that are have reasonable regulations, but you still get a lot of tourists there. Uh, and so I think these cities are striking a balance. They're striking a balance between allowing these SDRs to flourish and, and between maintaining community integrity. So I think this, these are good targets for investment. All right, almost done. Last couple of slides are about some emerging trends that you might find useful. One of the biggest trends that we're seeing in the SDR space is this rise of unique and experiential travel. People, they don't just want a place to, to stay, they want an experience. Did you notice the, the way that Anna had carefully painted the walls of her property in Florida? She wants to create an experience, right? And that's also why people like these tiny homes and tree houses and other unusual accommodations, right? You wanna offer something that a hotel can't, right? Instagrammable stay. People are willing to pay this a high premium for places that offer a unique experience. Cabin in the wood, renovated Airstream trailer, even a yurt in the desert. The more unique the stay, the more likely you are going to attract niche travelers who want an adventure and give you free advertising over Instagram, right? Workcations, right? Where people are combining work and vacation, they're on the rise. So these digital nomads are looking for properties that offer work-friendly amenities like super strong Wi-Fi, uh, dedicated workspaces, quiet environments, right? So if your property can cater to these needs, you can get a whole new set of travelers. And then there's this growing 
trend of wellness travel. People are, they want stays that offer more than just a bed. They want retreats that focus on health and well-being, you know, nature, yoga, wellness programs. Just tailoring your property to meet these trends can help you stay very competitive. And lastly, let's talk about screen tourism, right? People are booking stays that are inspired by shows like Emily in Paris or Game of Thrones, right? Travelers want to experience the places that they're seeing on television. That creates a huge opportunity for SDR Hopes host to offer these unique theme stays where the whole property is themed like Game of Thrones or Emily in Paris, right? You know, you can charge premium rates. People are going to pay more to live like their favorite characters. I mean, look at how much Disney charges for its hotels and cruises. So if your property can offer a, an experience, you're going to stand out. You're going to attract more bookings, right? Basically, you're turning your rental into a mini movie set, right? Mm -hmm. And then next up, we've got event-driven travel, right? So if you've tr ever tried to book a place during you know, the Taylor Swift era's tour or the Olympics, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Big events like these, they send travel demand through the roof. You know, you got concerts and sporting events and conventions, make a list. They all drive very high occupancy for short-term rentals at extraordinary prices. The impact is that hosts in these event-heavy cities like Phoenix are cashing in because their bookings are skyrocketing during that time, right? Great way to boost revenue, right? Super Bowl, Olympics, Swifties. This is one trend that is definitely here to stay and it's extraordinarily profitable, right? So if you're near a major venue, you can turn these one-time events into serious profits. And that's our last, last tip and it's a wrap, folks. Um, hope you liked it. Um, what you learned here is a tiny fraction of all the incredible and free knowledge that's available on our website, multifamilyu.com. From all these different speakers and many more, we're planning uh, 12 webinars this year, so keep coming. Um, and um, you know, check out the links that we're going to place in the chat. Um, Anna, if you can place a link to mission10k.com. And please, please, please answer the poll that Anna is throwing up for you. Remember, it has three some a number of questions that we want you to answer, not just one question. And with that, we are happy to take your questions. Uh, I do have a note for you. Unlike multifamily, unlike single family, we are not going to provide comments on your specific markets because the truth is we don't know enough about them, but we're happy to answer any general questions about short-term rentals. All right, I see people answering the poll. Thank you for doing that. Um, we have a question, uh, well, a statement. Air DNA data is flawed. If you ask any STR operator, they could be off by 20 to 30%. Yes, and it's... It's the same for CoStar, right? Exactly. So Anna and I use CoStar. And I think the key is to use AirDNA to target. So what you do is you basically go in, you get data, and then you validate it because it makes it much easier to validate. I mean, obviously on the dashboards, you can see all of the individual properties. And it should take maybe five or 10 minutes to, to validate that data by opening you know, Airbnb and actually checking the numbers. But it gives you pretty decent trends. I, on a day-to-day -day basis, I agree with you. But on a six-month, 12-month trend basis, I disagree with you. Because the trend data, they're gathering it all together. Uh, if you're looking at like real-time, well, today, you know, it says, you know, I should be at 148 and I look at the market and I'm at 162. Well, that's daily fluctuation. I don't think that anybody is going to get that right. But I think if you look at six-month, 12-month, 18-month trends, they have those dialed in. I, I would be very surprised if there was a variation of 25% in those numbers, maybe 2%. Uh, Texas was not mentioned on any slides. Do you know why, Neil? No particular reason. I mean, we are obviously taking data from our sources. Uh, maybe Texas is very expensive for the moment. I think Texas, one challenge is that, uh, you know, you're, you property take the tax, big, you know, property tax insurance. hit, you take the big insurance hit. <laughs> I mean, and you are already taking a big mortgage hit, right? By the time you take three big hits, maybe the yields are not high and that's why the sites are not recommending them. Yeah, maybe you could go back to the slides. I'm not sure that people really got that what the, those site, those um, locations that are being recommended by the source, say AirDNA, is basing, is looking at the home value yep. compared to the average daily rate. 
And the so, occupancy, right? And the so, occupancy, right. So what you want is you want this number to be as low as possible and you want these two numbers to be as high as possible. And that creates, you know, annual revenue. Basically, it's uh, occupancy multiplied by ADR is your annual revenue. So what you want is a home value that's as low as possible within annual revenue as high as possible. I mean, look at this number. This is phenomenal, right? 161K is the price to buy a home. Your annual revenue can be as high as 29K. And I know that's gross. It's not net. But even if it's net 20K, right, $20,000 when you're buying something for 161K, that's like 13%. I mean, who the heck doesn't want that? You don't even need to get leverage for that. You can just buy in cash and, and you know, clear 20K. So I think that these, th these kinds of numbers are absolutely phenomenal. Right. And that's the focus of this, not which is the best market to have an S uh, uh, SDRN, yeah. but what Texas is the could best be a great market, but what if, the, what if the prices are high, right? Yeah. Yeah. Texas is a phenomenal market, but, but, you know, I, I think the key is the, this, this, these two numbers, that's what we are focused on in the SDR market. You shouldn't necessarily look at, you know, which market it is. Sure. You might get more appreciation in Texas, but look, this is a business. You have to look at it as, as a business. Um, how do you compare AirDNA and Price Labs' ability to review the performance of your own STR property? Um, Price Lab is more of a platform for you know pricing management for moving numbers up and down. AirDNA gives you a lot more information, so I, we like using AirDNA for research when we're looking at um, uh, you know at where to go and things like that. Where Price Lab is definitely more focused on, okay, I've already got a property. How do I manage its rents on a dynamic pricing basis? So it's it's a more focused tool than AirDNA, which is which is wider. Wasn't there another tool, Neil, yep, that you said was it was competing with AirDNA? That's right. So uh, let me go to that slide. Like, um, uh, there's, yeah, I don't remember the names of the tool because it, it's been a while since I researched. But here's the slide for you. So. Uh, yeah, all the rooms, all the rooms. Yeah, is the I same, look, similar to AirDNA, and then Beyond and Price Labs are yes. more real-time pricing adjustment tools. So these two compete with each other, and then All Rooms competes with uh, AirDNA. Right. All right. Um, do you have any views on the midterm rental market, uh, like for travel nurses? I, you know, honestly, I've. I've done looked at this very recently because I have a very nice property in in um, San Antonio that I'm looking at for travel nurses. I find that taking data from the short term rental market and using it for the mid term rental market is very hit and miss. In fact, I would say these things actually don't correlate well at all. So I, I would say I don't I would not look at AirDNA data and try to use that for 13 week nurse rentals. Um, let's see some comments here. Price Labs has really good market research features as well that compete with AirDNA. And this person just started using that. That's um, great. It looks like obviously they're trying to become AirDNA. So they're adding a lot of stuff. So please check out, you know, it, the, the best thing to do is to watch five minute YouTube videos on each of these tools. And I think that's, you know, in 30 minutes, you know, six videos, five minutes each, you'll learn a ton about them. That's how here, I do it. Here are two more that have come up in comments mm -hmm. um, that sure. compete with AirDNA. Air mm -hmm. B ticks, A I R B ticks, Air B ticks. Okay. Okay. And B and B calc. B and B so, calc. Okay. That's yeah, great. So, it's it's so, good so, to so have you, new entrants yeah, in the market. Absolutely. Right? We, we love competition. And because it'll, you know, and so Google, you know, competitors to AirDNA and watch some YouTube videos. Yep. Um, any recommendation for seasonal areas, spring training in Phoenix, summers or fall areas, any suggestions? I think the, the best thing to do is make a list. I mean, and this is where ChatGPT is very helpful. So what yeah. I would do is, is I would fire up ChatGPT and say, I wanna do research on event-based and you know marketing. Um, so start, you know, maybe start with football and it takes a while to do this, right? So sit down with, um, you know, um, I, I usually use my phone, right? So I just basically, I actually have a dedicated button and it's hard to see, but if I tap on my, right there, you notice this floating button actually takes me directly to chat GPT because I'm, I'm addicted to it. And so I'll go in there and then basically start having a conversation with it by, by pressing my microphone button and then talking about 
football and basically say, okay, both for college football and for the NFL, you know, what markets make the most amount of sense from the perspective of, you know, training, what, what cities within those markets, because, you know, it might just be Scottsdale within Phoenix. It might not be all of Phoenix. Um, and I think ChatGPT will give you a, a good place to get started on that particular journey. Or, or, you know, maybe you're not into NFL, maybe basketball, you know, will will give you a better feel for it. These are obviously some of the better, best known markets, I think are already well exploited, but it's it's the secondary markets where people really haven't started thinking about uh, event-based Airbnb. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, is there STR data for international markets? We're not aware of like high quality data. I think that Europe does have its own air DNA equivalent tool, um, but we're not aware of any others. Um, so you might you might want to check out um, the tools in Europe. Keep in mind their their Airbnbs are way more expensive than ours. Are they? Hmm. Yeah, they're really expensive. Um, well, there's some questions about markets, but we've already said we're. We're not going to be able to answer yeah. specific market questions. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's a question. Will a copy of these slides and or uh, the recording be available after? Um, it will be available for a short time. Um, mm -hmm. But if you, you're you only able to watch the full recording for, I believe it's three days, mm -hmm. uh, unless you are part of our investor club. Uh, you can, if you're a bronze member, you get it for, you know, that you can watch 30 minutes of it or up to 20 minutes of it. But if you're a silver member or a gold member, you get to watch the entire presentation and you can come back to it even in you know a year from now. What do you need to do to be a silver uh, investor club member? All you have to do is have a call with our investor relations guy, Peter, who's awesome to hang out with. And how do you become a gold member? Well, if you're an investor with us, you're already a gold member. So all of our investors get access to all of our free content forever free. Um, forever. So that's a benefit of being one of our investors. But if you're not an investor, all you got to do is have a call with us. And um, and that's all you need to do to get access to almost as much as the gold. The gold still gets more. They mm -hmm. get more goodies. Yep. Yep. They get dedicated events as well. But um, but yeah, the, the silver level gets um, really um, a lot. Right. And all you need is a is a meeting with with Peter to, to get to that level. Yep. Awesome. Well, we'll take that as the last question. Thank you all for coming. Hope you enjoyed this. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Neil.